They both came from opposite ends of to land in North America. And here it is more blown up. If the Jaredites look at the top left versus in white Jaredite landing, if they landed near Seattle, they could have taken the Columbia River in green to the Snake River in brighter blue to the Missouri River in the yellow, all the way down to the Zarahemla or River Sidon, down to the green Ohio River, right into Rama. See all that connection? Now, yes. it's not continuous. There's a stop between each because of continental divides and other things, but they could have easily made their way. Now, when the Jaredites first landed, I think very easily, some of them were more comfortable. They wanted to go up north. They went up into Alaska or into Canada. Some of those people went down south, like the Olmecs of, of uh, the Mayan area. They were around in 1500 BC. Now, what so makes they, you say that they were they landed up north? Then, because of the current, they were brought. Okay, in. okay. And the current, it could have been a little more up into Canada. It could have been down into Portland. It could have been up into a land. But it definitely would have been up around the United States. Yeah, and didn't they land, didn't they sell to the promised land? Well, yes, I believe that. I came across Brother Ryan Nelson a few weeks ago. Uh, he is an interesting fellow. He is an amazing human being. And uh, he runs the, uh, well, he does many things. How about you introduce yourself, Ryan? Uh, we talked about maybe me doing a bio, but then I was like, you, you wear many hats. So I would like you to go ahead and talk about what, how we got in contact and who you are. Okay, thank you. Well, I first met you when you interviewed Rod Meldrum, who's a really good friend of mine. I've been with Rod for 12 or 13 years now, and I help him with his website and organize the events for the Burn Foundation Expo. I'm a writer, editor, got several small little books. I don't do much out in front of people. I speak at our expos and I enjoy it. I love speaking. I used to do seminars. I was a seminar director for Zig Ziglar, for Tom Hopkins, for Anthony Robbins, for a lot of people where I would just uh, kind of help their events get going. And I'm doing that full time with Rod now. And I just love it. I love the Book of Mormon. I've been a member of, my, of the church all my life. I'm uh, married in the temple to my dear wife, Stacy. We've got three, two children and three grandchildren. And uh, I'm just excited because the Book of Mormon is true. And I've known that all my life. And I love talking about it and discovering it. And I take Moroni's promise in 10 that I can know the truth of all things. If I pray, study, and get personal revelation. It's awesome. So I'm glad to be with you, Troy. I've seen you interview many people. You're a good, humble man. So I'm looking forward to this. Well, you guys only get me on screen, so it's easy for me to stay humble for an hour, yeah. right? <laughs> but you don't see me off screen. And I'm working on myself one day at a time like everyone else. Yes, I'm excited too, Ryan, because you, uh, and then you invited me to speak at the Firm Foundation. Why don't you tell the folks what that's all about? Um, we have a flyer even you could share. That's an annual and semi-annual event, correct? Yeah. Uh-huh. It's uh, like I show here, our next one's coming up in just three weeks, April 18th, 19th, and 20th. It's here in Sandy, Utah. I live in Bountiful, and this is going to be an exciting event. It's going to be the 33rd event that Rod's had. And so we have two, two a year, so that means he's done 16 and a half years of these, and I've been with him for about 13 or so, 12 of those years. But we're gonna look at all the guests that we're gonna have speaking. I've got over 80 people we've been asked to come. We've got 135 presentations. We'll have 100 vendor tables all at the Mountain America Expo Center in San Diego. Wow. You'll see Kate Daly, who's got 25 million views, and Greg Matson will be there, Kwaku L will be there, Steve Pineker, Paul, uh, the Paul brothers, only Hayden will be able to be there. Uh, we've got Joel Skousen who will be there. And then all of our regulars like Rod Meldrum, Jonathan Neville, Hannah Stoddard. So it list goes on. I love doing it. And then also on that same day, we've got on that same weekend, we've got on Friday only a whole bunch of our influencers that will be there. If I would have met 
probably a little earlier he would have been here with us. But I will be there this coming October. Yeah, well, October uh, yes, this coming October, I will be there. Yes. And, and that's always in Sandy? No. Uh, in October, it's going to be in uh, Eagle Mountain, just at the north tip of, uh, of Utah Lake. Nice so place we've never been to. It's beautiful. But look at the uh, podcast we've got. We've got Elder TikTok, Tao Fu Fano, uh, Tao Tai Fano, and Sarah Smith. We've got even Kevin Prince from uh, Scripture Central, Greg Matson, and Kwaku will be awesome. We've got David Douglas, bottom left, who does amazing Book of Mormon videos and has a broadcast. So, yeah, all of these people. Well, I've, do- I've had seven, I think I, one, two, three, well, and then on the other page. I've had several of these people on the program. Love them. Yeah. Good people. Many great ideas. Many, yep. uh, many great minds. Absolutely. Um, and also, also on Friday, we've got a scholar panel of, so yeah, part of our Firm Foundation Expo on Friday for, from like noon to four, we've got these three amazing scholars and uh, good, good men who will be explaining why the Book of Mormon is so important in understanding the temple and the covenants in the temple. And it talks a lot about our temple covenants and symbolic nature in the Book of Mormon. They'll be talking about that. Val Larson, you know, David Butler, who's got a lot of novels he's written. And then Greg Matson will be on top of it, uh, monitoring it and emceeing it, so to speak. So nice. come and, you can get tickets at bookofmormonevidence.org. We're excited to have it. Beautiful, beautiful. And you couldn't have picked a, a greater man than Greg Matson to uh, to MC anything. He is uh, definitely the guy to do that. Yeah. Even Cardinalis could do that, but then that would be a very interesting thing. <laughs> yeah. All right. So where where are we going from here? Let's see. What what do I need to say? Uh, yeah. So I'm excited about that. Let me do some house cleaning real quick before we get started. Uh, also, I am selling products, folks. If you see on a lot of my videos recently. Uh, the YouTube program, we've been allowed to sell products from Amazon. Even I'm still selling my merch and I'm designing my merch as we speak. I think I might be making some Jaredite stuff too, some logos uh-huh. to go on some t-shirts and mugs and stuff like that. And I'm working on uh, some uh, logos for the last dispensation that you can sport around on your t-shirts and sweatshirts and mugs and things. But if you look at the products, uh, I am selling them. We're able to sell them through Amazon and we get a pers- So isn't that neat, Ryan? Just in the last couple of weeks, I've been yeah. able to sell products from all different vendors and I get a percentage and it That's helps awesome. the program and it helps me and my family. Yeah. And this is what I do. Uh, That's also, awesome. yeah. if you guys want to donate to me, I would prefer you do it through Venmo cash app or PayPal. And you could see those in the links in the description field. Uh, of the video okay uh i think that's it thank you ryan all right where do we start here well you know i've been uh studying the jaredites for many many years and like most of us have it's hard to understand them because it's been so long ago but i think i've come up with some things that are absolutely amazing i first want to say that these are my own opinions they're not opinions of the firm foundation or Book of Mormon evidence or of Troy or of the church. I speak for myself and I feel very confident in these things. I always back it up with as much scripture as I can and the textual context of the Book of Mormon and then put it together. Now, I want to start by just saying the Jaredites, I believe they they had two separate barges that they created and I believe they landed in the Pacific because it took 344 days for them on their second visit, on their second set of barges to get to the promised land. Now, a lot of people will say they don't know where it came from or where they started. They'll say St. Lawrence Seaway or, you know, up through the Bering Strait. But I believe like you're seeing on the screen, the, look at the two key factors, 344 days and two sets of barges. And I'll explain it using basically Ether chapter two, about all I need to use. And it really goes over it well with, with everybody. So the first thing I would do is, is ask you a question. Where was Noah's Ark built? What do you think, Troy? Oh, my goodness. Uh, uh, what, I, I, would, <clears throat> I think I've had these, question, or these conversations before with, with uh, Rod off camera. Um, 
I would. Well, and I, I'm not asking it to embarrass anybody because most people. No, are, no. And I'm I'm guessing, but I think Noah's Ark was built in the United States. That's what I was going to say. Maybe and, close yeah. to where the Garden of Eden was. Yeah, yeah. And where did it rest, or where did it uh, end up? Well, we we always hear it was Mount Ararat, right? Yes, and I agree. So if it started in America and ended up in a Ararat, Mount Ararat, we got to understand what happened, or is that possible? And in understanding that, well, Noah's Ark, if you look in the top right and read with me, says the American continents were inhabited before the flood, somewhere in America. Somewhere in that region, Noah built the ark and preached the gospel of repentance from America. And this is a, good, a very good member of the church, J.M. Sondahl, who uh, was a Swedish immigrant. And if you look on the left where you see that great area of land, that could be called, uh, what is it, Mangia? Not Mangia. Um, Pan Pangia. But Elder oh, Pangia. Holland, are you, yeah, are you Pangia. Pangia, yeah. Yeah. And Elder Holland in the bottom pink area. Elder Holland said, temporarily, we call it America. Whatever its name and geographical configuration, it was from the beginning a land of divinity as a land of destiny. So he goes on in that talk to say that the land of America indeed was where everything started in uh, North America. You see there how North America is on the left side and it's all connected to the other green pieces yeah. and the white line between them. That's where it would break up and form the alignment. Right, right. And it's interesting because I've done a few videos in the past about Pangea. If you look at the map of the world, it looks like a puzzle. It kind of resembles a puzzle. Yeah, it does. And one of the best quotes is Elder John A. Whitstow in the bottom uh, right. says, Adam, after his expulsion from the Garden of Eden, now it's not church doctrine that the garden was independence missouri but it's been said by 20 different apostles and general authorities many years ago and why wouldn't it be if adam was placed in missouri and the new jerusalem will be in missouri the first is the last the last is the first and elder widstow said adam after his expulsion from the garden of eden lived in the vicinity of the great missouri and mississippi rivers Noah's Ark would be floated on the mighty rushing waters towards the Gulf of Mexico. So I believe when the waters parted, I'm sorry, when the continents parted and right. the Atlantic Ocean came in, that's how they ended up over in Ararat. In the old world, which is really the oldest world, is where we, before the flood, before the flood it's where Adam was placed, Missouri. Right. That's where it was, but we call that the new world because we're newly discovering Now, on the next, I want you to think for a minute. I'm just letting you know I'm being as quiet as possible because everyone gets mad when I interrupt people that have a lot of good things to say. So that's why I'm not talking. Well, and I'm okay with the interrupting. I, <laughs> I just, I love teaching and I love feedback. So, okay. But if you read in Ether chapter 13, the quote on top says, the waters had receded from off the face of this land. It became a choice land. Okay, now Ether is being abridged, his records by Moroni at this time. Now you see that big picture, that's Mormon, a beautiful art by John McNaughton. And underneath the table is Moroni, because Moroni is his son. Well, later at the end of the Book of Mormon, Moroni is abridging the records. And where would he be located when he's abridging the records? New York. Right. Well, where I would believe that. Here? I'm st okay. I'm believing that more and more and more and more. <laughs> yeah, because... The waters had receded from off the face of this land. So if Moroni was in New York, this land would be somewhere in New York. Okay, wait, let me back up for a second. So do both the, the Meso people and the Heartlanders believe that Moroni abridged them in New York? Well, not really most, no. We don't really get put emphasis on where he abridged the where Moroni abridged the plate. So, right. Right. He, he abridged them after Moroni, after Mormon, because he was given right. some records, but then he couldn't continue because he ran out of ore. Right. Okay. But he wasn't living in Mesoamerica, in my humble opinion. Right. Uh, he was living in New York. And when he said, off the face of this land, this land meaning the land of the United States of America, and it also continued in 13, chapter 13, a new Jerusalem will be built upon this land 
we all know it's it's revelation. This land in Missouri is where New Jerusalem is going to be. We know that. So if he's talking about this land, he's pretty close to it. It's the land he's on. Well, well it's interesting that not I, I'm a, a quick observation of the child that's playing with toys underneath the table. It almost sets him before he traveled. You know what I mean? So that yeah. was definitely created by somebody meso right there. <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah. I'm joking. I know. Unless he had children later in, in by uh, New York or grandchildren. Cause yes. we don't know. He might've traveled with a, a caravan. Oh wait, he didn't come from central America. I'm joking. Yeah. That was it. Yeah, I know. Well, Mormon <laughs> has to be from that last battle, right? Mormon was up right. there in the North country. What's the North country? Well, the furthest top North of the United States and, on the uh, east side, northeast, up in Camorra. Right. So on the screen now, you'll see an overview of 17 points of going through ether and why I think what I'm going to tell you is pretty darn accurate. And obviously, I, I make mistakes. I'm not perfect. I don't claim to be that. I am just giving you information from the scriptures that I think is very plausible. And so people can take a screenshot of this as I now go through points of it. And I'm not going to go through all of this. Uh, I've got a talk I'm giving at the Firm Foundation about this, and I'll put maybe 40% of my talk right now that I'm going to talk about at our event. So but here's where it starts, Ether chapter 1. It says, Jared and his brother and their families went down into the valley, which was northward. Now, think of the Tower of Babel. That's where it all started. The Tower of Babel, or that general area in Iraq, is where they built the, the big tower. And the tower would probably be, or the city of Babylon would be on the top of a hill, more than likely. So they're first told to go north, and that's probably near the Tigris River, and they probably went northward into the valley. So they came down from Babel, went down into the valley to gather sheep and oxen and herds and bees and whatever else. But then after that, they went north. I think it's just a short few miles they then turned around and went north, I'm sorry, south. Because if you read in, continued on verse 2, it says they went on the journey south, which was the quarter where man had never been. Right. Let me explain the place where man had never been in a minute. But let me first ask a question that most people... <laughs> now, I was going to ask you, can, all, can my viewers, those who view this... Can they um, get these images? Can we put them together in a PDF file? Or Yeah, sure. Okay. And any, anybody can uh, just email me at ryannelson at AOL.com. And Ryan is spelled with an I. So it's R-I-A-N-N-E-L-S-O-N. And I'll also have all your links, the Book of Mormon uh, evidence link, because you are right. the guy that runs that with Rod. And any other links that you have, they'll be in the description section that you can email me. Right. Now, here's okay. a question I, I really just came across probably three or four months ago that I feel strongly about. I always ask people for the last year or so, did the brother of Jared have the priesthood? Now, there's nowhere in Scripture it says that, and but I found some things that I think is very accurate. I mean, wasn't the brother of Jared's experience with the Savior, they were some of the most righteous people ever, and they were on the land around 2200 B.C., which is, you know, 3,700 uh, years from when Joseph Smith was there. Right. But, but look at the bottom, the quote I have. The promises, and this is from Bruce R. McConkie. He says, these promises of God to the Jaredites contain the essential elements of the everlasting covenant detailed later to Father Abraham and to every covenant people. These elements include priesthood, posterity, and a land of promise. So just like Lehi had the priesthood, all right, they had the priesthood, the Jaredites did. And this is significant because remember, after the flood, there was only Noah with his three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. So every person in the world comes from Ham, Shem, or Japheth through Noah. And Noah comes through Adam. But Ham, Shem, and Japheth, understanding who those people are today is, is huge. And do we know which is the priesthood lineage of Ham, Shem, or Japheth? It's Shem. It's not Ham. It's not Japheth. Japheth are the Asians mostly. Ham are the African Americans mostly. And Shem are Middle East. All right. Right through the uh, Mesopotamia. 
So they had the priesthood. And I want everybody to think of that as I go through this. Now, the one other thing I want you to understand is the ocean currents. Our good friend Philip Beale, who was the ship captain of the Phoenicia expedition, and Heartland Research with John Lefgren and Mike and Betty LaFontaine own that ship now, and they're rebuilding it in Montrose, Iowa, across from Zarahemla. And Captain Bill has been 30,000 nautical miles in a replica 600 BC ship. And this is what he said to me. As far as sailors are concerned, wind always trumps tide. So you can go any direction with the right wind. Right. Going with or without the tide. But let's understand. My da- I remember my dad uh, bought, when I was young, we had these Book of Mormon readers. Not the Book of Mormon reader from the church, but we had these hardback Oh, yeah. uh, about you know what i'm talking about 12 yeah, volumes cartoon, cartoon books. yes yes yeah, from the great. 70s the late 70s it. early 80s and my dad would he, we would read those together and he'd talk about the jaredites and he'd go they followed the trade winds son they yeah. followed the trade winds i don't know what he meant by that but he would always well, say that it's, it's very true because look at this <laughs> look at the top in pink there were no barges i'm sorry the barges had no sails so they had to follow the trade winds they couldn't follow I'm sorry, they had to follow the tide because there was right. no wind. Right, yeah. I know. But, but it's but just interesting. Like, yeah, and the 600 BC ships. Either way, they were guided here. They were guided. Yes. That's right. They were guided, but without a sail. All right. So they had to be barges. So if you look in the, the rivers, can you see my arrow pointing as I go over it here? Yes. yes. Okay. You see over here in the bo- in top left, it shows the white circle. They started, I believe, their second voyages from China, or Japan, or Taiwan, somewhere in that area. And why? Because see these pink arrows here? Yeah. This is the Kushiko drift, and goes right into the North Pacific drift, which takes them right into Washington state. These, that's the, the red, warm temperature tides, okay? And you see down here, the ones in the middle, they're going the opposite direction, and so, Somebody going from South America over to Singapore would be a natural tide. But going from China over, the natural tide would be up through the Alawatians, Alawait, Alawait Islands, yeah. Yeah. to North America. So, so you're saying they definitely followed the wind? No, they definitely, barges followed the ocean tide. I mean, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah. The opposite, because they right. didn't have sails. Right, right. Right. But here, here's my proposal. Let's now start right there in Baghdad. That's Baghdad, Iraq. And why do I start there? Because that's where the Tower of Babel was, that general area. It was about 400 miles from the Persian Gulf. And it was probably about the same to the Mediterranean. So it first said in Ether 2 that they traveled in the wilderness and then they were commanded to build barges, their first set of barges, somewhere new, near, I believe, Kuwait, right there on the border of the Persian Gulf. Because see the ship in the middle, there's replica ships. They feel that the scientists and historians have said 5,500 BC was discovered the oldest ship. Now, I don't necessarily believe 5,500 BC, you know, times are off and wrong and so forth. But it's very old that they had ships. Okay, we didn't come over this Bering Strait deal. Right, we had ships all over the place. Or there could have been some that came over the Bering Strait, but oh, sure, there there could. But you know, I would say most people got here through boats and ships. Yeah, Yeah. just just traveling up to the Bering Strait takes you forever. But anyway, I think they went to the Persian Gulf, and this is their trip—the first of many waters that they're going on. Now, let's divide Babel in a quarter, one line through the middle and one line through the other, north, south, east, west. And in the very middle point you see is the Tower of Babel. And the scripture in Ether 2 up top says, being directed continually by the hand of the Lord, and the Lord would not suffer they should stop beyond the sea in the wilderness. But why do we have them going the south quadrant towards the east? Because they were told to go the pl- go to the place where man had never been. So look at Babel in the Babel in the middle. 
Well, man had been up here into Russia and Northern Europe. They'd been over here into Europe. They'd been down here into Africa, but where they hadn't been is mostly down in this area, which is full of water, starting with the Persian Gulf. So they most likely went to the Persian Gulf and started crossing the many waters. They did not cross the Great Deep at first. The Great Deep is over there in China, the Pacific. Right. The Great Deep is the Indian Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean. But in the scriptures, when it says many waters, they mean the seas, the inlets, and so forth. So here's how I project it. The Jaredites landed, uh, or the Tower of Babel, Noah landed there in Babel, and the Jaredites and many others spread out all over that continent. But the Lord said to the Jaredites, go to where man has never been before. That's in the yellow area where it says many waters. Okay, They went on the many waters because they didn't hit the sea because they were too great to cross. The Lord guided them throughout this whole entire time on the many waters. Wow. Because a boat or a barge could mean, if you look in 1828 dictionary, it could be a pleasure boat, a vessel, a boat. Right. It could be a lot of things a barge could, and it could, it could also possibly be a sailing ship. So remember, North America was saved, and so was South America as lands that the Lord didn't want to be overran. So that's why the Jaredites didn't even know about it. I mean, the Jaredites more than likely didn't even know there was an Atlantic Ocean at this point. Do you know why? Because why? after the flood and then the Atlantic Ocean appeared, they lived seven, eight hundred thousand miles inland from the Atlantic Ocean. How would they know it even existed after the flood? That's true. Without That's very true. Going out there and reporting to them. All they probably thought is there's one big ocean out there. And if they're in the Tower of Babel area, they're told to take the many waters to build ships, their first set of barges. Sometimes I'll interchange barges and ships, but always know what I mean. When I talk in the first voyage of the Jaredites, it could be sail, sail, not barge. Okay. And here's here's why I think. Okay. The great deep being the oceans, the many waters being gulfs, bays, seas, and straits. Now, on the bottom right in pink, these are the names of some of the pro proposed seas or uh, many waters, I'm sorry, that the Jaredites took. They, the Persian Gulf, the Gulf of Oman, Arabian Sea, Lakadive Sea, Bay of Bengal, Bay of Gulf of Thailand Sea, uh, China Sea, Philippine Sea, Sea of Japan. None of those were out in the deep ocean. They're all closer to the shore where they used a specific type of barge or sailing ship along those waters. And they could hug almost close to the coast the whole way. But the Lord told them, do not stop in the wilderness before, in the, before these many waters. So I think they got all the way from Oman, I'm sorry, from Kuwait and the Persian Gulf all the way over to Shanghai or to Japan. And that's where they stopped, and they named it Coriantumr, and they stayed there for four years. Everybody knows about that. Mm -hmm. they it. So they stayed, I believe, let's call it China, for four years. Now, here's what I would propose then. Why Number do you one, think, said, okay, but why do you think they stayed in China for four years? Well, they stayed at the end of the barges. It says that in the scriptures. That's what I like about this. You're you're following the scriptures. You're not making yeah. things up. You're you're actually yeah. you're you're finding, and and that's what we I think we fail to do that as, on academically is we don't stop in the little places where explanations can well where things can be more expounded upon in yeah. those little. And of course, I'm I'm interpreting the scriptures, but we well, all of course, need to do that with right. Prayer. To understand, but the Lord said, "Take the many waters," and then they stopped. And I'm guessing this took them anywhere from thirty to forty-five, fifty days to stay on these little tiny gulfs and inlets. And the Lord directed them. And then it it says later in Ether chapter two, verse sixteen, that they were commanded to. They stopped. They named the place of the land Coriantumr. I'm sorry. Moriantum. Mm -hmm. You know, remember Mahanrai Moriantumer. Yes. I get tongue tied here. Sometimes. No, I do that too. I used to call him Mahan Mahanrai Coriantumer. 
I know, I know. And I'm like, no, it's Mahan Rai Moriankamer. Yes. Mahan Rai Moriankamer. Yes. Yeah. He, that's where China was because they stayed there four years, according to the scriptures, and they were commanded to build barges like unto you hitherto have built. Okay. Let's see if we can find that. Okay. After the last of many waters, if you go back to Ether 2.16 and 2 chapter 5, they ended up in the China area, but they waited there. So it took them 30 to 50 days. And then all they could see clear over here in Moriankamer is they could see nothing but ocean in front of them, more than likely. And they were told to stay there four years. So the end of the many waters is like in China or Japan. Now, they were told in Ether 2.16, to build the ships or barges hitherto or similar to what they built before. But these had to be different. How were these different? Well, they were going to go on an ocean. They weren't on the many rivers or many seas. They're not going to go in the great deep. So the, the barges had to be shorter, tighter, like a dish. They were only the length of a tree, 75 to 100 feet. And they had to build those to keep them so that the great sea or the deep sea did not pulverize them well they were like many arcs well yeah there were two sets that we know of according to the scriptures there had to be the first set of barges somewhere in kuwait to go to the persian gulf and to sell the many waters and then there had to be an additional one because in ether 216 it talks about that additional set of barges okay does that make sense yes and in that second set they had to be more unique because they were going to go in the great ocean or the great deep or the deep sea. There's several names in the Book of Mormon, but the sea is, the oceans are never called many waters. And I can show you that as I go through this. So if you overall take the look of the Pacific Ocean, it's the greatest deep, in my opinion. And the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian Ocean are the great deep, but they're not many waters. The many waters are in pink at the bottom that are more towards the shore. They're not out in the middle of the deep. They're more towards the shore. Right. And the Pacific Ocean. So when we're talking about waters. many, when we're talking about many waters, we're talking about seas, basically. Yeah. Even like the Great Lakes. Or gulfs. Yeah. Seas. Gulfs, straits. Bays. Bay. Yeah. Straits. Those are many waters. Okay. And they're totally different to navigate than the Great Ocean is. Do you go by kind of how sailors spoke? many uh centuries ago as well so we, yeah, if I, you use some of their terminologies then you can well, yeah, little, understand not, more too i get it from philip beale who was a navy captain from britain <clears throat> who sailed the phoenicia right because i'm thinking him. more about the pseudo biblical language that the Bi the book of mormon used it's interesting because you you and uh if you put together royal skousen and what he talks about and how the book of mormons you know what i mean yeah and and some of the terminologies that you go from the 1500s to, you know, our current day, for instance, I know you're going to, you're not getting into this now, but bringing up, uh, the, uh, the narrow necks, you know, what George, right. Wa how George Washington spoke, the book of Mormon is written in a pseudo biblical language, which was yes. in a, and also in a style from about six, 15 to 1600 till the 19th right. century. Anyway, I just yeah. found it interesting. And, and the book of Mormon was translated through, a lot of the logic and understanding of Joseph Smith. Right. It wasn't just read off a stone. Exactly. It, Joseph had to think, understand, and then have help with the, the two stones that were attached, like my glasses. These are the Urim and Thummim. All right. And he had to look at that, take his own mind, and then replay kind of what it said. For example, I, Nephi, having born a goodly parents, is not what he wrote from the, the stone in the hat. He probably had something in his head that said, oh, Nephi had a really good family and, and his parents were awesome. Okay. Right. So he wrote down, I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents, using his own speech. Pattern. Yeah. It's very interesting, you know, not to get off on a tangent because I'm going to be quiet again. I love what you're saying. Uh, but yes, it, it not unlike how we wrestle with the Lord in our own prayers, how, right. not, not unlike how we receive personal revelation. The Doctrine and Covenants. Study it out in your mind. You took no thought, save it was to ask me. The Urim and Thummim probably worked the same way. It wasn't, it wasn't a crutch. 
it was a, a an addendum instrument to and an instrument to to helping him receive further light and knowledge and i love that that's right exactly i love it so here's why i think the 344 days is so important if you remember the march 11 2011 the japan tsunami there was a, a place called the international pacific research center and they took a look after this this tsunami in Japan, they followed and tracked the debris that would naturally flow by the tide and how long it took and where it went each time. So in eight months from that tsunami, it was in the middle of, you know, lower quarter of the ocean. In the 10th month, it was further along. In the 12th month, that debris first hit Seattle, Washington, northern Canada. So no, no sailing ship would, I mean, a sailing ship could take that wind, but this was only the current. And the current debris went from Japan to Washington State in about a year. That's 344 days. But the wow. Jaredites were on the land, or on the ocean, I should say. So that validates that for me, to follow the currents of the same ocean at a similar distance as this tsunami did. That's why 344 is so important. You know, if if they went, if the Jaredites went on the Atlantic, just let me ask you this question. If the pilgrims, they left Spain or, you know, wherever they were in Holland, actually, but they left Spain and they got to the promised land of Plymouth. Do you know how many days it took? Uh, not sure. 69. 69 and, days. Okay. All right. Now, if you took Captain Beale who sailed from uh, Tunisia in through the Gibraltar to Florida, it took him about 38 days to go straight. Wow. Right? And it would take the other people, like Mulek and others, it would only take 50, 60 days maximum on the Atlantic Ocean. Compare that to the Pacific where debris went in 344 days. Right, right. It has to be a large body of ocean that is tremendous because also in ether, it said they had to be protected against the whales and the large ocean flow, you know, and they would get buried in the deep. Well, they don't get buried in the deep in the Bay of Bengal, you know, or in the Taiwan Sea or whatever. They, they would just maybe even sail casually along for 50 days. But when you get to that Pacific Ocean, man, it's huge. And you're going to spend a lot of time on that water. That's true. Well, I mean, and it doesn't mention anything about them stopping in those 344 days either. No, and they, they didn't. They were in those for 344 days. But it does say on the first part, this, this map you're seeing is kind of my overview of everything that I can now go back and regroup some of the stuff I said but kind of organize it. If you look at the, the left side with the yellow three-quarter circle, okay, that three-quarter circle, then read in yellow, it says that quarter where there never had man been, ether 2.5. So see, man had been almost everywhere since Noah's flood. They spread out all over, but they didn't spread out because the ocean was too much below them. They just stayed right there in that land area. But the quarter where man had never been has to be the southeast quadrant. All right. And they did cross many waters, Ether 2 6. You see the green on the far left? Those are the names of all the seas they crossed. Now, a sea does not mean ocean. Okay. How about the Caspian Sea? How about the Black Sea? How about the Dead Sea? How about the Mediterranean Sea? Were those oceans? <laughs> this is amazing. Okay. It's looking a lot like the Pacific. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I love it. And, you know, in white, you see in the middle, it says, the Lord would not suffer that they should stop beyond the sea in the wilderness, ether 2-7. So the white line from the three-quartered yellow moon type thing, the white line goes all the way along to C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6. And on the left, they're numbered. And there is an ocean flow that goes this way at certain times of the year. Now, sometimes... The inland water will tide differently than the outside seawater. Like there's the Indian monsoon season, 
where the Indian Ocean goes opposite of what these trade winds do. And I'll show you that here coming up. Now, hold, now what, okay, so what, what are we proving here again? Just We're to proving, let everybody know, I know what you're talking about, but let yeah. the folks know again, why is it so significant for us to know that they traveled uh, specifically and not Atlantically? Because of the way the Lord has peopled this earth, Knowing where the Jaredites traveled from and to is significant because I can show you later, I believe Lehi traveled from Oman, the same general area where the Jaredites started, but he went the opposite way around Africa. Okay. And I'll explain why. The Jaredites, I think, went all the way across to, to China and they were commanded, don't stop anywhere along the way. Don't stop anywhere. Well, is this to show that where they landed? Are you kind of trying to show us where they yeah, landed, right? I'm trying to show you where Jaredites most likely landed, which has to be the promised land. Right. Just like Lehi landed in the promised land, just like Mulek landed in the promised land. I want okay. you to see this overall picture. So understanding from my perspective, China or Japan traveling on a barge, which had no sails, following the currents of the ocean. It took 344 days. That's not made up. That's in the scriptures. You tell me anywhere else this could have happened with 344 days. I've looked for two or three years, can't find it. Atlantic makes zero sense to me. And I have still good friends in the Heartland Movement who believe that it happened in the Atlantic, the Jaredites, and believe it was probably the St. Lawrence Seaway. Can't be. 344 days, no way. It just can't happen. Right. So unless somebody tells me something better, this is what I'm going to feel. The big deal is they'd have to go up and down the the Atlantic Ocean 20 times to get 344 days. Right. Okay. It'd have to go up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. So why would the Lord have him go up and down when, you know, it's really 344 days from China to Seattle, Washington. It's actually that. And that's proven in history, like the one chart I showed you. And I've yes. many others. Right. So right. That's why I'm far away from Atlantic. Yeah. Okay. Now here's the current I told you about. This is called the first set of barges, the monsoon summer currents. And this is uh, from this Indian monsoon current in Wikipedia. Now you see the arrows at the very top left where the babble is up here, top left, right? They traveled on foot to the Persian Gulf. And you see this red dotted line? That's all hugging the coast, but it's many waters. And look at where the arrows are pointing. What's the monsoon? You follow those arrows and it follows every single one of them right into Taiwan or Shanghai during the Indian monsoon summer. It happened just like that. So oh. if, if I show you other months like January, February, March, these ocean currents would be going the opposite way with the Indian Ocean. But there, here is a significant place you can check. And I've been on the water virtually you know, <laughs> everywhere trying to figure out if I could find something that corroborated what I'm talking about. And I think this does very nicely that it goes right through there because see at the bottom in the paragraph I have in red, it says currents can be contrary to the main oceanic flow or can be in the same direction, but greater. And then the last section in red, it says during the summer, the direction overseen or reverses with eastward flow extending from Somalia to the Bay of Bengal. So it goes east, which is from the Arabian Sea over towards Shanghai. It doesn't right. go the other way. But Lehi started right here. See where my mouse is right now going around? Yes. Top left. That's Oman. That's where Lehi left from. But he went the opposite way. But these arrows don't show that, do they? No. That's because he didn't travel in the same year nor the same period of time as the Jaredites did. And I'll show you later where those arrows point the other way for Lehi. Well, your point, when they went Atlantically, it, they would have done it in a shorter amount of time. Yes. Right? Yeah, and, very short. And then... And that's why I said Columbus and Mulek and Captain Beal, it took them 30 to 50 days, 60 days to go and, across. And you Atlantic. haven't really gotten into the meso theory yet of what they think. No. But... You're, but now they would have used sailboats if they went through the Atlantic, right? Yeah, but the sail didn't come around until about uh, oh, until much later, about 600 oh. BC. In 2200 okay. BC, they might have had sails, but it was mostly oars 
or drifting. Okay. As gotcha. I will show you later. So, okay. Go ahead. Go back to the other one. That's all I wanted to know. That's okay. Uh, good question because I have to see to believe. I can't just read something. I have to, I have to create maps. I've created over 3000 maps. Wow. Because <laughs> wow. that's what teaches me. Right. I got a 200 page uh, map book. You can buy it on our website at bookofmormonevidence.org. And if you just email me, I'll send you two or three or four free maps just so you can see them. Nice. Nice. Okay. So the one thing that, uh, when I talked to Rod Meldrum, uh, he still isn't totally convinced of what I'm saying, but he has not looked at it like I have. And for the last year, I've been trying to get him to watch just one of my presentations or just let me explain it to him once. And he hasn't done that for me for a year. <laughs> we spent we spent five or six. It hours. doesn't it doesn't surprise me because he doesn't get back to people right away. He no, doesn't he, answer oh, your text right away. He's so absolutely amazing. But he went two and a half years building that home, and I felt like I lost my friend. I mean, you know, Aww. I hardly talked to him. You know, but that's that was okay. his baby. That was his yeah. baby. Yeah. But you know, he's done with that, and he's going nuts now. He's got like ten with you already. Almost. Now, seven. can I ask hey. you something? If I was to, you're going to let me know when we segue, right? We haven't segued yet. No, we haven't. What would you overall title what we're talking about now? This whole since you began. The, the travels Jaredites, of the, the Jaredites. 344 days Pacific landing. Okay. Their travels, like basically like their travels. Yeah. Yeah. So this is all about the Jaredites. And I got to this screen where you see now, this is showing you now some of the artifacts. Because Rod always says, well, I don't know about the artifacts. Where are the artifacts on your thing? Da, 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 da. I've shown him like 20 different things, but he can't take the time to spend, which, hey, it's fine. I love Rod, no matter what he does. He's, you know, I'm with him 1,000%. Right. But I love for him to help me to confirm what I'm feeling. Is he and skeptical he, about these artifacts? No, not, not, or he just really? hasn't had time to look at them? He just hasn't. He has no idea. Okay, he gotcha. No, he hasn't looked at so, them. So here's, right, look. here's what I want to show you <clears> about <throat> the artifacts of the Jaredites in Japan, Shanghai, Taiwan. There's all kinds of artifacts. How about in Alaska and Canada? and Seattle along the coast in Portland. If the Jaredites lived in both places, there has to be evidence, right? Right. Well, look at this ancient Chinese explorers that landed in America many, many years ago, about 1200 BC. These artifacts are dated on the left. And then the ancient bronze artifacts in Alaska reveals trade with Asia, and these date to two, 2000 BC. So these so, two, uh, what? Explain the three squares I'm looking at up here, where well, under where it says ancient Chinese explorers landed in America. Okay, those are all Chinese languages that are similar to their ancient Chinese and to current Hebrew type things. Because if you read down here, it says uh, Albuquerque petroglyphs. They were both used and seen in the Bronze Era in China, and suggesting they are are also transitional periods in China. So there's different periods of time where this writing is similar, found in China, found in Seattle, and other places. So I'm just showing you there's evidences of existence of people in China around the same time as the Jared. I see. So that's what okay. I'm trying to show. Well, it's okay. neat. You have the two, the hieroglyphics there, uh, or the writings. Yeah, and they're mostly Chinese that were found over there. That's okay. amazing. Petroglyphs had the location upon Russ Camp's request, this guy, he shows native cultures that are over there in China that are also found over here in America. Well, and we do we know for sure that these are authentic engravings and they're not uh, I, I forgeries or... I can't swear by them. Okay. I can say I've studied the internet. I've got probably two. What Were those on walls? Was that on a wall, a cave wall? Or? On, a, on the internet. Type in the title at the top. You'll no, no, no. It. I mean the actual... Uh, engravings are those on, on stones? Okay, stones, you know, hard driven in. And where were they found? Well, they were found in both China and Albuquerque. On the West Coast. Yeah, they were found both places, so it ties them together. There was a civilization on the far east coast of Asia and the west coast of America. Ah, I kind of show those parallels that there's things dating to the Jaredite time, right? Which is okay, 2200 BC all the way to 500, 580 BC, 
when coriantumer was picked up by the Mulekites. So it's a long span of people. The Jaredites were all over the place for a long period of time. Okay. Now let's take a look at the two voyages of Jaredites and the Lehites and compare them. The circle in the middle represents the United make, States. Make sure you tell me when we segue. I will. Okay. So this United States of America in the circle shows you little rivers in there that they could traverse the Jaredites wherever they went. And the Lehites could also traverse. I believe that the Jaredites leaving from China area, taking the Kuroshika current and the North Pacific drift, drifted 344 days right into Seattle or near that area. The Lehites, they started from on the far right of this map, where Saudi Arabia Peninsula, where it's called Oman, and they sailed from there down towards, you know, the, have you heard of the Comoros Islands? Yes. The Comoros Islands. Do you know what the capital city of the Comoros Islands are? What? It's right off the east of, uh, of uh, uh, Africa. It's called Comoros is the capital city of <laughs> Moroni. Wow. Today. Now, is that significant? That is very, know. it sounds significant know. to me. But you know what? Could Lehi have landed on the Comoros at the city Moroni? Yeah, he could have. He went right past it. Okay. But he went down around the tip of Africa, and then his goal was to hug. Now, this is, I'm talking, his goal, I'm talking about Philip Beale. Right, right. Asian. He didn't know about Lehi. He's not LDS. He's just a British admiral from England that that knows his stuff and wanted to recreate Herodotus' event of circumnavigating Africa for trade. Well, he followed the path that you're looking at in red, where Lehi went down, I believe, around Africa and went trying to hug the west coast of Africa, but couldn't. The currents took him straight into Florida, straight into the Gulf. Now, he, meaning Philip Bill, <clears throat> did not land in Florida. He went and caught the northern currents, went back into Gibraltar, mm. landed in Lebanon. But he proved a plausible voyage from Oman to Florida. Interesting. Plausible on a 600 BC replica ship that he designed after the Jules Verne 7 ship that was found off the coast of Marseille, France. That was a 500 BC ship. So wow. he patterned that after it. And he took this first voyage. So I think Lehi very likely landed there somewhere in near Tallahassee, Florida, in the Panhandle. And I can show you that later, too. But I believe the Jaredites went to the opposite side of the United States and landed somewhere in Seattle. This is how the Lord is spreading the gospel to the, the promised land. Right. He's bringing it from the old world both directions, to the west coast of America and to the east coast of America. But I just want you to see how the two sides meet in the middle. They were both of these groups, the Jaredites and the Lehites, were both destroyed at Cumorah. Because the Jaredites, they called it Hill Rama. And that's in the Book of Mormon. Hill Rama is the same as Cumorah. Exact same hill, one in the Hebrew language and one in the Jaredite Interesting. Language. Very interesting. So we know that's a fact. A right. scriptural fact. Okay? And it says that in, uh, I think it's chapter 6 of, of Mormon. So they came together. Well, they got to the promised land on opposite sides, but they eventually got together to have final wars in about the same area. The Lehites went up north to Cumorah, and the Jaredites came from the west all the way to the east in Cumorah. Now, why did they travel so far? Well, when the Jaredites came, they had, remember, Ham, Shem, and Japheth were the three sons. They all had to be part of where the United States of America started in Seattle. Because I believe that Noah's sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, all portions of them were with the Jaredites. It wasn't just the chosen lineage. I think there were Asians, Africans, Europeans, and everything else you can name that were part of the group of the Jaredites. Interesting. And they intermingled, but they had the priesthood. Remember in the book of Abraham? Well, Egyptus couldn't have, you know, Ham, who married Egyptus, couldn't have the priesthood, his descendants, but Ham could have had the priesthood because right from Noah. Now, are you basing that because maybe Babel was a very metropolis area? 
Well, yeah, that's where the nations of the world started. Almost like Egypt was at one time where there were many different races of people. Right, because most people not in our church believe the Garden of Eden was there near Babel or there right. in Mesopotamia. We don't. We believe it was in Independence, Missouri. Okay, and but we believe the first inhabiting of this new world started with the Jaredites. 2200 BC, which is only 145 years after the flood. So right. So what flood, about, so what is this time span maybe between Enoch and Babel? Okay. Basically, uh, Adam, now I'm using johnpratt.com. John Pratt's a wonderful man. He's passed away. He's, he was good friends with John Lefkren. They did a, a video together. He's a uh, rocket scientist who knows the maps very well on calendaring. He knows the Enoch calendar and the Mayan calendar and the Hebrew calendar and everything else. And he has estimated times based upon the solar, what the solar soon, uh, solar calendars and moon calendars, say lunar calendars. And he estimates that Moses was placed on the earth about 4070 BC. Okay. Based upon a significant idea that you don't, but let's just say 4000 BC. Right, right. He then says that the city of Enoch was translated in 3313 BC. So about 680 years later, after Adam, was Enoch. And they were taken up. And if you want to know most of the people in this world today that are helping us are probably those from the city of Enoch who are translated or resurrected, who are helping us in this world fight Satan. I thought about that too. That yeah. that crossed my mind as well. I always thought maybe yeah. the city of Enoch is so close and they are still relevant when it comes to them coming back yeah. well, to the new know, Jerusalem. Can, They're going to come down to the new Jerusalem. Yeah. And when come down to, it really means they could already be created right now. The new Jerusalem could already be created spiritually before it was uh, Almost like uh, be, when we talk about like, gathering Israel, right? Yeah, it could be translated already, the city of uh, New Jerusalem. It could already be in a in a sphere to just the Lord lays it down, and a day later, here it is, you know, right in Independence, Missouri. I believe that's where a lot of the Native American Indians of the United States are now with those who are going to build that New Jerusalem in the spirit world. Because in 2015... I don't want to go into too much. This is a different topic. If you want to know about I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get us into that. No, no, no. If you want to know a different topic about the baptizing of 85 Native American Indian chiefs uh, and us discovering it, not until the year 2015. Well, let's do a show on it. You're going to come back, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. It's we can do many, many different programs. Let's do one yeah. about the 85 chiefs baptized. I love the Native Americans. My mom and dad met on an Indian mission in New Mexico and Arizona. My son went on a mission to Alaska, to the Inuits, and I went on a mission to the Fiji Islands. Oh, wow. The children of Israel. Well, look, we can do shows that are 20 minutes long, even if it only takes us 20 minutes. We don't have to do three-hour programs all the time. No, we could do, no. you could come back and you could talk about the, the chiefs, the 85 chiefs for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever. Okay. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, you went to Fiji. I went to a very foreign land. America. I went to Salt Lake City. <laughs> I did. I served my mission in Salt Lake City. That's awesome. Um, That's cool. My first companion was from Fiji. No, what was his name? Elder Das. Das. That means he was an Indian Fijian. Yes. He was originally from India. Yes. Because half of the population of Fiji are Indians from India. Yes. He was very much Indian. Indian, a very little guy. And I was this big guy yes. and everybody laughed because he was, yeah. we were like Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> yep, I know. Except, except Laurel was a, uh, <laughs> a little Fijian Indian guy. <laughs> yeah. I learned a little Hindustani that they spoke in Fiji. That's I neat. mostly, I just, they speak English because they're so confused. Right. Of what to speak. So they both came from opposite ends of to land in North America. And here it is more blown up. If the Jaredites look at the top left versus in white Jaredite landing, if they landed near Seattle, they could have taken the Columbia river in green to the snake river in brighter blue to the Missouri River in the yellow, all the way down to the Zarahemla or River Sidon, down to the Green Ohio River, right into Rama. See all that connection? Now, yes. it's not continuous. There's a stop between each because of continental divides. 
and other things, but they could have easily made their way. Now, when the Jaredites first landed, I think very easily some of them were more comfortable. They wanted to go up north. They went up into Alaska or into Canada. Some of those people went down south, like the Olmecs of, of uh, the Mayan area. They were around in 1500 B.C. Now, what so makes they, you say that they were they landed up north? Then, and... because of the current, they were brought. Okay, in. okay. And the current, it could have been a little more up into Canada. It could have been down into Portland. It could have been up into Alaska. But it definitely would have been up around the United States. Yeah, and didn't they land? Didn't they sell to the promised land? Well, yes, I believe that. Okay, so Seattle is about as far north as you can get, but that doesn't mean they couldn't have landed in Canada because that was the promised land, but they didn't stay there. They ended up down in the Snake River, Columbia River, Missouri River, Ohio, and the Adena culture of people we attribute to the Jaredites. They might not be the same people, but they lived about the same time. Well, and the Book of Mormon never said, it didn't say somewhere around the promised land. Oh, I don't think so. Right. And and I don't I haven't seen any countries in South America that that or Central America that uh fit that description. Yeah, or even Canada. Or even Canada. Especially yeah. right now. Yeah. So anyway, you can see how the rivers would go that the Nephites and the Jaredites, I believe they were their trails were on the rivers of North America. Not through the land all over the place. They traveled rivers. I mean, they, they could travel where they were from on the Euphrates and the Tigris. I could tell you later that I think the Euphrates and Tigris rivers of the book of Genesis were actually in Independence, Missouri. They were just called differently. You know the four rivers leading out of Eden? Yes. Okay. I believe that was the Ohio River, the Missouri River, and the Upper <clears throat> and Lower Mississippi. Well, I mean, you're not the first that has said that. That's, yeah. that's so, definitely something that makes sense right and and now, with me, the pangea and you connect pangea the wait go back for a second i'm sorry i think it was the ohio river that can actually connect with the euphrates yeah if well, you put I, everything back together right or am i wrong i think i think going from independence missouri to uh where the tigris and so forth are could be maybe two thousand miles apart instead of twenty thousand okay you know what I mean? Because the wa water was not there. And that's a real rough estimate. But but I can show you on that previous map I had. So let me talk about the Jaredite. Two of the most significant things that all Heartlanders know and love is Kennewick Man is the oldest known Native American that has been unearthed by professional people. And it was done in Kennewick, Washington. And it was found to be about two to 3,000 BC in age, the Kennewick man. And they know it was a Native American, not a European. Now, that's not too far from where the Jaredites landed, Seattle to Kennewick. Okay, so that could be the Kennewick man that came, they say it was from the Nephites, but it could have been from the Jaredites. If they had the priesthood and they had a lineage going down and they were Native American, well, I think there were Native Americans that came from the Jaredite side. Right. You know, we right. didn't call them, you know, Lamanites. We called them Jaredites in one of three groups. So, but also look a little further away in Nez Pierce, Idaho, there was the Chief Joseph Abbott. Do you know who Chief Joseph was? Oh. He was a very, very wonderful Nez Pierce Indian chief in Idaho. And he's one of the guys that our military, our army captured down there by, uh, Little Bighorn, and by you know, in 1890, where the, the wars ended and so forth, they found Chief Joseph. And in his pouch on the side was a little pouch, and it had an Assyrian, ancient Assyrian symbol on it. And inside the pouch, he pulled it out, and it was a cuneiform tablet about one inch by one inch by one inch by a quarter of an inch. And it had writing on it in the cuneiform language. Mm -hmm. And they meaning the historians have dated it at 2040 CBC. And Nez Pierce Indians, no chief Joseph said, the Indians before us were not, or the people before us were not our color. They were white. My ancestors are white, is what chief Joseph says. That's and interesting. The Syrian cuneiform tablet, do you know what was on it? They translated it. It was a 
receipt for the purchase of a sacrificial lamb. Wow. So Chief Joseph's ancestors were sacrificing animals in North America. Yeah. I've actually seen that before. I remember seeing that and I yeah. can't remember where though. So these are two places fairly close to where he landed, where the Jaredites, I think, landed. But there's many other things that I could tell you. So here is Chief Joseph Cuneiform in the top left. And in the bottom right is Chief Joseph. And here in the middle in pink, it says what's inscribed on the cuneiform. It says, Nalu received one lamb from Abba Shaga on the 11th day of the month of the festival on, in the year Emma Galana was installed as high priestess of Nana. That's what was translated on that cuneiform stone, which yeah. is 2042 BC. And well, was, isn't the, some, so I, I've heard this before too, and not to get off on another tangent, just real quick, but a lot of the customs of the Northern Native Americans resembled a lot of the things that we do in the temple. Um, the raising of the right hand represented the priesthood. Right. Just a lot of different things. It, yes. It's amazing. But you know what? It's even more so among the East Native Americans, the Algonquin and the Iroquois. Because the Algonquin and Iroquois on the East Coast of the United States, up by New York and up in Canada, they actually have Hebrew DNA markers. The ones in the Western United States, the Hopi, Navajo, they have Asian markers. They don't have Hebrew in the Western United States. And it goes from Alaska all the way down through Central America to South America. That's all Asian markers. So more than likely, the Algonquin and the Iroquois are those who had the temple ceremonies. And some wow. of them migrated, of course, west and intermarried with the Navajo and the Cheyenne and the, the Hopi and others. Yeah. But we have that demarcation. We have not found Hebrew DNA west of the Mississippi with the Native Americans, just east. Okay, now here's another one. This is the same, see the red arrow on the top? That's a skeleton of Kennewick man. They've drawn that in, but that's where he was found. Just like this. Our good friend David Reed has a book called Face of a Nephite. He goes through all the DNA analysis. So is this a photo of before it was dug up? Uh, I'm assuming so that it was. So they're just the kind of putting, superimposing that in there to show us right, where it exactly, was before they found exactly. it. Okay. To show you an approximate location, how it was buried and right. how it was sitting when they found it. And the, the crust of the ocean kept breaking away, breaking away, breaking away until it exposed the skeleton. So, but it's been DNA tested and it does have haplogroup X, which is the Hebrew marker the Eastern Native Americans have, which is pretty cool. So we think it happened around the Book of Mormon time frame. Now, let me get into four other hypotheses of where the Jaredites travel. Okay. Number one is Hugh Nibley. He said they came from the Tower of Babel on the far left and went up north across a possible sea that was up there, which isn't today, and then across the Caspian and the Black Sea, and then eventually into China. That's where Hugh Nibley thinks. But he doesn't talk about two sets of barges. He talks about one. Okay. Now, the other one down below is Nephi's Code, who believes South America was the place, okay? And if you look from China in the left to the right, Mesop Mesoamerica, they couldn't have traveled that way because the currents didn't take them that way. They went exactly the opposite direction on the current map that I showed you. Now, right. they could have come down around Australia and back up to Colombia or Colombo, but they couldn't have gone straight across. They had to go up north up through Alaska and into Seattle, based upon they were barges, they were following the currents. So these are two other hypotheses. I got my idea a lot from Hugh Nibley saying they went this way. I think he got the direction right, but they didn't travel on a sea stop, travel on a sea stop, travel on a sea stop, travel on a sea stop. They were told to go, never stop in the wilderness beyond the sea, which he hadn't read probably. <laughs> right? That's pretty significant, I would think. Yeah. Well, number three is is the Mesoamerican theory. Remember, they started around Tower of Babel, they say. But remember, I read in Ether chapter 2, verse 1 or 2, it says they went northward to gather their herds and flocks and so forth. Well, Mesoamerica has them traveling way north, up into what they call the Valley of Nimrod. Okay? 
And then they have them coming back down, I guess, and then traveling the Mediterranean Sea. Well, that can't happen because the Mediterranean from Israel to Florida is like 40 days, not 344. Okay. And look at the Jaredites. Now, this is a couple of people at the heartland who were great people. They say they went from the Tower of Babel here in the middle and they took the Mediterranean directly. Well, I put a big X through it because give me 344 days. Why do I emphasize that so much? And two sets of barges. That's critical. Nobody really puts that into their equation like I have done. So I'll right. just think of things, which doesn't mean I'm right, they're wrong. It means they have a different opinion. But I want you to really search and pray about this way, not because you'll get to the celestial kingdom by knowing. <laughs> I don't get to the maybe the lower part of the celestial kingdom. <laughs> He's joking, <laughs> folks. I'm joking. We have to tell the people out there that don't know what know. humor is. I know. That so, we're joking. So there's other theses, but I think one of the one that I thought the most of was Jonathan's, because Jonathan Neville matched Hugh Nibley's on this previous page. He matched that, that they could have gone up there and then gone around and settled in uh, North America. But I, he doesn't have the right many waters voyage and then the Great Sea. So. And even yeah, when you, no, I love Jonathan, but I'll point out to him somewhere where he got something wrong and he has a hard time digesting it. It takes well, him a what, while. What he says <laughs> is there are, there are certain, there are many ways to open a cat or many ways to eat an <laughs> elephant. You know, everybody has a different opinion. Many ways to dissect a cat is that a good, yeah, or dissect a frog I, or whatever. I said cut yeah. open, but you know, I know. Yeah. I just ramble sometimes. But here's what I love. Look at the spreading out of the Lord's people with Noah on the left where the Tower of Babel and, and Noah landed there. And look how they spread out all over. And then look at the Jaredites, how they spread out all over. But some of the Jaredites, I'm, I'm sure, likely stayed in China or Japan and spread out there into Mongolia and into Russia and other places. All the Jaredites didn't probably come. There were some that didn't have faith, I would think. You know, they, they were there 150 years in China, at least. 160 or 70, and they didn't all say, okay, yeah, 170, yeah, we'll go with you. You know, they stayed and populated the Eastern continent. And some, the Jaredites, they went down into South America. The Olmecs are dated at 1500 BC, which is down in Central America. They're the ones with the big heads that they've discovered, the Olmec nation. Yeah. yeah. I don't think they were of the lineage of Shem, they were probably the lineage of a mixture of Japheth and Ham or either or, but they went down there. But the brother of Jared's people went from Seattle directly east towards Hill Rama. Now, why would they go towards Hill Rama? Because Lehi went towards Hill Rama. Why did they meet there? Because that area of Ohio, Pennsylvania was some of the most fertile, beautiful land for vegetation, for game, and everything else. They went there together because the Lord was blessing them both with equal things. So much so, their last battle happened at the exact same hill. Wow. Now, the world population between Noah to Abraham was almost 300 years. The world population at the time of the flood would have been estimated at 235 million people, which is in the Turkey area, Turkey, Europe, Africa, East Europe, okay? So 200, well, we have 380 million here in, in America, or 330 million. So that's not many more they had in Abraham's time than we have today. So it's not like they were everywhere, but they were in a considerable many places. But the world population at the time of Abra Abraham is calculated at 2,800,000. And the time of Abraham was about 2,000 BC. Okay? That's not a lot of people. No. But, you know, how, how about having six wives with Abraham or, you know, four? And how about they populate 2.8 million? Well, now, the, the Lord had a way of trying to populate the earth, didn't he? Yeah. Well, we had spirits in heaven that needed to come down and right. experience. Now, here's a list of 21 places where there are artifacts all over. Just Oh, that. more than one way to skin a cat. That's what I was thinking. Sorry. There it is. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're skinned and ready to go. <laughs> all right, go ahead. But I'm going to be are, quiet. Look at Ryan. No, no. It's not that I don't, that. I know sometimes you're waiting for me to go, Ooh, ah, I'm at all at all of this, No, I, but I'm going to be, care if you, uh, well, I want to be more quiet so you could get through this. I don't care. It's fine. You're awesome. Okay. 
So these, take a screenshot if you're watching this at home, and then go in and Google every one of these 21 items and see how much archaeology you can find in Japan, China, Alaska, Washington, Canada, British Columbia, Portland, Oregon. You see how much is here dating from number one, 13,000. Look at this. Oldest bone projectile point in the Americas found in a mastodon, the Manus Mastodon in Sequim, Washington, which they date at 13,900 BC. Well, are they off? Yeah, I think they're off. Anything that says 13,000 is probably more like 4,000. Right. When the Earth started, you know? But as far as they can tell, they're not saying 1 million years old. They're saying 13,000. But that's an actual stuck, a point stuck inside of a mastodon. You know, kind of like Zelf with the arrowhead in his ribs. Mm -hmm. okay, number three, arrowhead dating back 6,000 years in Williams Lake, British Columbia. See, I'm looking for Jaredite times. Okay, number six, Bluefoot Cave, Bluefish Cave in the Yukon suggested 24,000 BP, which is probably closer to uh, BP is before present. And it's just a way they calculate using 1975 as a non-movable date, but don't get into that. Uh, look at down number 10, they practiced smoking for 4,500 years in the Pacific Northwest. Number 13, the Soba Stone Pillars of Taiwan 3,000 years ago. Number 15, ancient Peruvian culture known as the B9 culture, 5,300 to 2,300 years ago. So you can see there's a lot of stuff that I've got 200 of these, but I just threw 21 on randomly to show you there's proof that Jaredite artifacts could have been found on the East Coast in China and on the West Coast of Seattle. Mm -hmm. Both places. And to summarize that, here is in Seattle, these are all places or in Washington State where they found smoking pipes, like the Hopewell Indians. So this map shows all of the locations of ancient tobacco or smoking pipes found in the state of Washington. And we know that they are dated, some of them are close to the Hopewell times, which is in the Eastern United States. So they could have been intermingling and so forth. But smoking pipes was one of the most sacred things they did. They didn't always smoke a pipe to get high. Right. They smoked a pipe to watch the smoke billow up into the air as the spirit going up to meet with Heavenly Father or the Great Spirit. Well, most and of the so, time, it wasn't anything hallucinogenic. It was uh, tobacco well, it or been. other herbs it or spice. I mean, you know, there's some of them that did it to get high, and there's others that did it to get high in the Lord. Depending on what they, right, exactly. Yeah. So this is the evolution of those smoking pipes within the state of Washington. Now, look at this. In October 2020, this is a list of all the counties, and it lists over 35,000 ancient Native American sites or mounds or villages, 35,000 just in the state of Washington, all the way from the West Coast, all the way to the middle, to the end of Washington. And I've got these that go in Oregon below and Canada above. There was all kinds of statewide sites that these people could have lived. But most of it was ground over by Army Corps of Engineers or farmers or whoever that didn't like mounds. They like flat ground. So this just shows you it's very possible the Jaredites could have been in the state of Washington. And they could have migrated on rivers all the way over to where the Adena ended their life or the Jaredites ended their lives in Rama at Hill Cumorah. But everybody didn't go there. It's like... You know, the Nephites, they didn't, were not all destroyed at the Hill Cumorah. There were some that didn't even come to the fight. There were some that probably escaped into Europe before the final battles at Cumorah. Well, of course. I mean, there's many, many different variables of what the Lord life, didn't say life happens. Yeah, the Lord didn't say you're utterly be, being destroyed means not one of you left. Right. It means you're utterly going to be destroyed from me, from my gospel, from mm -hmm. what you're doing. Okay? So... I think that's really significant. But I think this um, last slide in this whole part of the Jaredites, last two slides, I want to connect now the Jaredites to Hagoth, to Lehi, to Joseph Smith. I want to connect these people. Well, the Polynesian in South Pacific in 1911, look what was said in red. 
on top. The Lord directed their course away from this continent, America, that's a quote, to their the Polynesian ancestors' island homes that they might not be left to be preyed upon and destroyed by the more wicked part of the house of Israel. This is talking about Hagoth in about 56 to 63 BC. He was living, Hagoth was a mixture of probably Nephite, Lamanite, and Judite. Okay, there was all three in, in Zarahemla, right? The Nephites mixed with the Lamanites, which mixed with the Mulekites, which mm -hmm. were Jewish. So they all mixed. Well, why did the Lord take them away to Hagar in the ship? Because he wanted them to get away from the inevitable destruction of all those people on their way to Yokomora. He wanted to save the children of Israel by setting them aside and making Hagar their prophet, and they landed in the islands of the South Pacific children of Israel. Now, this is a quote by a letter from the First Presidency, Joseph F. Smith. That is so neat. And the bottom section in yellow, let me just read that red part. It says, and we repeat, the reason that few of the islands of the sea have been more highly favored and blessed in the Lord than those of your brethren on this continent is because of the worthiness of your forefathers who were led away and separated for their brethren of this continent. And because of that blessing, the Lord, which has attended you and your children from the time to the present. So is that why a lot of Polynesians believed that they were Nephites? Or Lamanites. Well, a lot of them had, believed that they were Nephites. Like we talked yes. to some of the older Samoan and Tongan people. When yes. I was on my mission in Salt Lake, I covered a few uh, Polynesian wards. Yeah. And a, a lot of them would... You, we would say, oh, you guys, somebody would say, oh, so you're the Lamanite. No, no, we're Nephites. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they would say so we're true. Nephites. But you know what? They want to be called Nephites because at the end, even the Lamanites were called Nephites. And, uh, and, and the anti-Nephi Lehi's. Were, yeah. Right, while they were righteous, when they became wicked, they were all called Lamanites. Right. Which, it, which shows you it had very little to do with uh, race. No, it had everything to do with, right. How you live. Yeah. Right. So exactly. the Polynesians are sweet. They're nice. They're so amazing. They are so different than any Asian that I've ever known. They have the true spirit of so the do the, of Israel. the Filipinos too. I noticed that the yeah. Filipino people are like that too. The gospel spreads there and they're they're very similar to the Polynesian people. Yeah, they are because the Polynesians are really three nations. There is Polynesia, Melanesia, and Micronesia. Melanesian are the darker skinned people mixing with Europeans are Polynesian. The Melanesian are the Europeans mixing with African, which are Melanesian, and Micronesian are Europeans mixing with Asians. They're all together in the South right. Pacific. So, and they have the blood of Israel mixed with Asian do. Asiatic uh, DNA markers. Without a doubt. So in concluding my idea about Lehi's sailboat in 600 BC, they probably did not have steering oars and rudders in Lehi's time because they were invented in 100 AD. I'm sorry, they, they do, did have some type of a steering oar and rudder, okay? Because here's what you need to understand, I think, is the more, the more time goes by, the better ships we have that sail further. Compare Columbus's boat with, say, Lehi's. Well, Columbus, they had all kinds of carrick cells. They had three, four lines of cells up and down. They had probably 30, 40 cells on those ships. The Phoenicians had one cell. The Bargians had none. So I think when the Lord says Lehi or Nephi, I command you to build this ship, not after the manner of men, but after the manner which I show you, he could have shown Nephi to put more than one sail on or to put a better keel on or to better have a steering type of an oar he could have done that ahead of 600 BC, and it wasn't invented until later when they came out on other ships. So very easily that could have happened. Now, let me tie it all together. The brother of Jared is connected to every prophet, including Joseph Smith. Read here from Joseph Fielding Smith. King Mosiah possessed two stones which were fastened into the two rims of a bow. Not a seer stone. Fastened into the two rims of a bow, 
called by the Nephites interpreters, which he translated the Jaredite record. That, those were handed down from generation to generation for the purposes of interpreting languages. Joseph Fielding Smith said this. He didn't say a seer stone. And in red, it says the Urim and Thummim, or two stones given to the brother of Jared, were those in the possession of Mosiah, appears evident from the Book of Mormon teaching. Joseph I would like to point out something, too, that I don't feel like anybody else has pointed out. And tell me if I'm wrong. Can I, can I add something? Sure, do that. I've heard, how many prophets have we had in this dispensation since Joseph Smith? Oh, what is it? Uh, 18, 20? 18, something like that, right? Yeah. Out of all those prophets, I have never heard one say we used a seer stone. No. Not even President Nelson. President Nelson did a demonstration, and he, and he specifically said, with, when he grabbed that hat, he specifically said, some believe that it was done like this. He did some not say... Some suggest, yes. Some suggestions that we have, this is one. And right. One suggestion, because he listens to his historians. Exactly. But he did not say that he believed it himself. And he did no. not say that this is how it was done. Now, out of all those prophets in this dispensation, we have had some say that it was done by the Urim and Thummim. But never yes. once have you ever heard any prophet say that it was done by stone a seer stone. Right. Right. Exactly. Now, understand this. This might come as a surprise. The term Urim and Thummim is found nowhere in the Book of Mormon. No, it's not. It's, it's Nephite only, interpreters. That's it. Yeah. That's all. Okay, interpreters, plural, doesn't mean plural, a single stone. Right. Right. And Urim and Thummim doesn't mean a single stone. But some in the Mesoamerican camp say he took his glasses, the two stones put together, and put them together in a hat. Right. Well, because the, the term glasses wasn't really a right so the other thing too is that the angel the, the exhibits a through e what are exhibits a through e that the three witnesses were shown right the no, hold on. don't say the, they were shown they were the uh, 17 doesn't say they all of these were shown but you give them to me and i'll tell you which ones are correct okay the the uh the liahona it was that in with the gold plates Okay, so when the three Nephites, when the angel appeared and the table, there was a table. If you read the... Uh, yes, I, I know what you're saying, but that was not... Investigating the Book of Mormon Witnesses, I think it was uh, R Richard Lloyd Anderson? Yes. Uh, they didn't all see all of those items on the table. They would be shown all those items if they were worthy. Some people would. Okay, okay. Well, either so, way, my point is is that the Urim and Thummim was were part of was part of those uh, things. Yeah. Okay, but no seer stone. And well, right. That's the point I'm making is that the angel showed that he did not show seer stones, which shows you that's what was used to. This was evidence of of translation. Yes. And so, the Liahona and the sword of Laban were not in the stone box at Camorra. They are not articles of translation. The only thing in the stone box was the gold plates, the spectacles that had two stones in the rims of a bow, and the breastplate. Okay, so then why do we think that five things were shown to the three witnesses? They mix up DNC 17, verse 1, and what they want to be found in the stone box. See, Mesoamericans have to... No, 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 no. I'm not talking about what was found. I'm talking about what the angel presented to the three witnesses. Well... It doesn't matter where they were found. Okay. I'm saying the, as evidence of things. Okay. You know what I mean. I, yes, I now understand. The three witnesses, in my opinion, at that time that they saw the gold plates, did not see the other items. And the eight witnesses did not see the other items. Oh, okay. They okay. could have been shown those other items later, but not at that time. Because so, DNC 17 says others may see all of these. They didn't say they did see all of these. Yeah, but did did uh, did Oliver Cowdery, Martin Harris, or uh, David Whitmer, did they say they saw five of those things? Not that ever? I know of. Not that oh. I know of, just the gold plates. And okay. remember, Martin Harris never said he didn't get to see the gold plates at first. He was shown them later. 
well, he had, he left the group right. because he was faithless. And then Joseph knelt with him later and prayed. And, and the but here's the came. important things comparing this to translation. There's only three people in the church. Well, let me, let me go to the next slide and then I'll touch on that. Sure. Sure. The brother of Jared touched 16 stones, two for each barge. That's in China. The second set of barges, he didn't need stones before, which I think they might have been sail sailing ships and not for as long of a, a way. They didn't need to see because the Lord was in the cloud directing them with the first set of barges. But the second set of barges, they had 16 stones the Lord touched for the brother of Jared, right? Right. Okay. But he really touched 18. He touched two additional ones for Joseph Smith. Because if you'll read... In these scriptures that I've got, let's see, I, I, it's in my other presentation. Ether chapter 3, verse 23, 24, 25. It says in there, that no, in Ether 4, 5. Ether 4, 5 says the Lord touched an additional two stones and commanded the brother of Jared to seal these up with the Jaredite records and do not let them be seen until someone after my coming in the flesh will be able to use those stones to interpret languages. So the brother of Jared had the Lord touch two stones, and they were sealed up with the Jaredite records in the hill Cumorah, the same place where the plates were. And they were now picked up by Joseph to use as interpreters. Well, okay, so later, did did the brother, did Mah Mahanrai Moriankamer, did he... Uh, fashion the the wire rims around the stones? You don't know that part. Okay, okay. We would all be guessing, but I doubt he held Well, two, but Joseph did say that they they were fastened to the breastplates. Yeah, they were they were like this. Let me show you. See that down on the bottom on Joseph Smith's feet? No, I know what they look like. The yeah. breastplate. But then right. the glasses in his hand were hooked onto the breastplate. Right, no, I know that. Okay. I know that. But what I'm saying is, do you think that... Um, they had to been fashioned by someone. Yes, they had to be. And it could have been by Moroni or Mormon. Right. You know? It could have been by an angel. It right. could have been people over the years that it could have been my, by Mosiah. Right. And he used them. Gotcha. But Mosiah could have, the brother of Jared could have, Moroni could have, I don't know. Right. Okay. Interesting. But that's not talked about. Yep. That's neat. And then lastly, in this set, I want to talk about the book that I wrote. And show you in these scriptures in verse 28 on bottom left it came and to pass can we order. get can we order your book are you going to leave the link to where yeah, we can well, order you, your you book you can just go to book of mormon evidence.org and order it okay it's called these these stones fastened to a breastplate it's only eight bucks I'm not awesome to make money on it it's you know of course but, uh, so the scripture in ether 328 says the lord commanded him that he should seal up the two stones Okay. In verse 24, it says, In his own wherefore I will cause my own due time that these stones shall magnify to the eyes of them which ye shall write. So in Ether, he's talking about Joseph Smith. Okay. He's talking about getting those two stones and translating. Now, I believe Joseph Smith translated the plates with the breastplate here in this picture, bottom right. Right. And the, the spectacles were attached with one rim. Why do I say one room? Because I got three or four people that say that, including William Smith and a couple other BYU professors. And over here, see, jo I'm sorry, over here, Joseph and Oliver, Oliver did not need to be hidden with a blanket. In fact, I think the only person that had a blanket between them was when Joseph and Martin Harris first did the Lost Pages. Because I've got three or four quotes that there never was a curtain between them with Emma or with well, Dan, Dan Peterson says that too, um, yeah. that, that there was a blanket over the, that there was a blanket over the cabin doorway. It's not, a, it's not even that David Whitmer said, okay. in a quote that they took a blanket and put it across the, the main, main room, front room across the windows. Okay. So that nobody could see in from the windows, what they were doing. Ah, I got it. Now, okay. That's only David Whitmer. And three paragraphs before that, David Whitmer was saying Joseph's a fallen prophet and an evil whatever. It was a quote he gave to a newspaper. Right. So after he's talking about the, the blanket going across, he's ripping on Joseph Smith. 
Well, but and I also find it. Form. Well, and also one of the biggest evidences that I've seen is what uh, uh, Jonathan Neville shown some big evidence. And one of them was uh, where Joseph is asked in an interview. Well, just from that Leahona article that did you watch that that I did on the Leahona article with him? I think so. They just they, tell things were redacted. Basically, Joseph has asked in an interview. He's constantly mentioning using the Urim and Thummim to translate. Oliver Cowdery attempted to translate. Later says, I, try, I used the Urim and Thummim. Well, he doesn't say that, but he said he saw the breastplate and the spectacles. Well, he, did. well he did say that he, he tried to translate, yes. Oh, but he doesn't say exactly how he tried to translate. Yeah, okay. he doesn't, he doesn't but say But later how. he says it was by the Urim and Thummim. Yes, he says that. Yes, in okay. Joseph Smith History 175. So why do you think Emma was so set on the seer stone? Well, Jonathan answered this in several places too. Uh, Emma's last testimony was done like six months or something before she passed away. And it was written down by Joseph Smith III. Right. And it was, it was published after she died. Well, and he didn't even believe some of the things she said. She could have had dementia or something. Right, right. Because so, she even says that Joseph never uh, had plural marriage, she, that he never participated right, in plural marriage, that, even though she that. was a witness to some of those plural marriages. Right. Right. And we, we believe that is not correct, that Joseph did practice spiritual plural marriage, not evil plural marriage. Yeah. It was to seal families together. That's right. Right. I am families. I do and not so, believe for one moment. Well, okay. When you say evil, I'm not, I don't, I believe Brigham Young was a prophet. Well, yeah, he was, but he didn't have any evil polygamy either. Right. Now, William Law probably did, who got expert. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I mean. Adultery yeah. is what I'm talking about. So it's very interesting. This is interesting. Um, that the seer stones, uh, well, some will say, what's wrong? Here's a, so I'm just playing the devil's advocate with you, Ryan. Some will, because I taught on my mission that we use the Urim and Thummim, okay? I never once knew anything about a seer stone till later on in my life. Me too. Okay? I taught that on my mission. Joseph Fielding Smith said that it was a, a doctrine of the devil that, <laughs> that a seer stone was used. However, some of the scholars today will say, what is wrong with a prophet if Mahanrai Moriankamer can create or get seer stones? What's wrong with a modern prophet getting his own seer nothing. stones? There's nothing wrong. Joseph Smith probably had two or three other seer stones. Well, we had the chocolate one, right? The chocolate. But he, but he didn't use them for translation. Right, because even uh, Wilfred Woodruff put one of them on the altar of the temple. Yeah, a white one. A white one and uh, called... Uh, Oh gosh, what was it called? Name? There's also oh. Gazellum. Gazellum. That's it. Okay. Gazellum. Sorry. Yep. You know, I know I got Alma 34. And you know, that is so, there's a comma put in there that changes the entire. I've got a whole slideshow. All right. This. Let's not get into that. But anyway, it's amazing. Right. It's amazing. Uh, but on this last slide, there's only three people that saw the three items you're, you're, the breastplate, the spectacles, and the plates. Two of those were Joseph and Oliver, and they witnessed. The third person that saw all three items was Lucy Mack Smith, like in this picture on the top left. But she saw them covered in a linen. But she touched them, she felt them, she described them. She said they're, it gl glistens like gold. It's worth about $500. It had four straps on it. The silver, the, the stones were round. Uh, and crystal and like what you'd call spectacles or whatever. I mean, so she saw them underneath the linens before anybody did. All right. And I love that's why I created this art because Lucy Mack Smith is a wonderful example of what she taught her kids. Her book is one of the best, The History of Joseph Smith. By what do you mean Lucy you created this art? Well, I paid an artist to paint it. Oh, I was going to say, did you paint this, Ryan? That is amazing. No, I, I painted an artist to paint. That is amazing, brother. I well, love this. I love this are, so much. Yeah, these are originals that I have here. I've got eight or nine of them, different ones. So now that's the end. But you can get copies of these. Just email me and I can send you pictures. Yeah, absolutely.